the early 1840s when he first put this theory together in sort of outline form, he let her read it and then asked her to put it in a drawer and publish it after he died. He changed his mind when he lived a lot longer than he expected. So um, she was well aware of his thoughts and all she hoped for was that it would not, his theories would not um, disqualify them for time in heaven together. And there's a lot of very tender correspondence between them that's on the record. Little notes that she would scrawl to him, little notes that he would scrawl back to her. So it was understood, and he did not pay the price that he feared with his family whatsoever. We're going to have to wrap up. We'll save some of those questions. We'll have another question and answer session after I finish a little bit of talk here about what was in the origin of species. So thank you for those questions, and I owe you a T-shirt. Um, so let's move on to what's really in the origin of species. It's two main ideas. I don't know, 600 pages. It's great reading. I really encourage you to sometime take the time to read the real thing. But I'm going to just focus on two ideas. Here's the first. Descent with modification. Darwin said, and we'll just take it right out of the origin of species, several classes of facts seem to me to proclaim so plainly that the innumerable species, genera, and families of organic beings with which this world is peopled have all descended, each within its own class or group, from common parents and have all been modified in the course of descent. This was a huge idea, this idea that all life is connected through ancestors back further and further and further and further into time. It was a bold idea, very, very bold, and really built on, at the time, a modicum of evidence, but nonetheless, a, a grand theory. It, Darwin represents this idea, really, with his tree of life. This is the only figure in The Origin of Species. Not a very heavily illustrated book. One figure. And Darwin points out that this great tree of life fills with its dead and broken branches the crust of the earth and covers its surface with ever-branching and beautiful ramifications. Now, if I wrote like this today, all of my peers would just wipe me out, okay? You're just not allowed this kind of poetry in scientific journals, all right? But Darwin was trying to get people to understand the inspirational view, the grandeur of his view of life. And that's why he talked about filling the crust of the earth and covering the earth with its, broken, its beautiful ramifications. Well, what did he mean by filling the dead and broken branches of the crust of the earth? He was talking about fossils. He had good first-hand experience with fossils. And of course, the fossil record was one of the best sources of evidence of the fact of evolution. Darwin, as he explored South America, for example, he was exploring the mountain ranges and the seacoast. And to show you here a couple of uh, paintings that depict explorers from the Beagle going across South American mountain ranges. And the bottom is a drawing by Darwin mapping out some of the mountain ranges. Well, he was up on a road in the mountains at 13,000 feet, and he sees fossil oyster beds at 13,000 feet above sea level. Of course, the landforms have changed. Of course, the species have changed. He understood that life, that the surface of the earth was far more dynamic than he was first taught and that most of the world believed at the time. So the fossil record is a tremendous source of insight into the actual history of the earth. And from about 1860 to about 1920, after the publication of The Origin of Species, there was a golden era of, in paleontology when some spectacular deposits were discovered that hold key insights into life's history. And I'm going to highlight four locations in North America, each of which can be visited, that hold some of the oldest, youngest, and most dramatic episodes in the fossil record. So in a map, I'm going to show you some. They're all west of here. Um, but as I said, some are uh, more easily accessible than others, as you'll see from uh, some of the pictures of these locations. So I'm going to start with one of the oldest fossil deposits. And I'm going to talk about the Burgess Shale. Now, this is in British Columbia. It was discovered by Charles Wolcott in the early 20th century. That's Wolcott on the right at the quarry that he was working on. And what came out of these quarries were these little animals, some somewhat familiar to you as trilobites, others that might look a little more uh, foreign. A shia is an example. These are some of the earliest complex animals in the fossil record. They're over 500 million years old, and the original specimens can be seen right at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. Just step right inside the Hall of Dinosaurs, and in some glass cases right there, you'll see pieces of the Burgess Shale with these very animals that you're seeing pictures of inside them. So over 500 million years old. Now let's go a little bit younger to Dinosaur National Monument on the border of Colorado and Utah. 
a fantastic place, both in terms of scenery as well as fossils. This is Jurassic Age deposits. Of course, Jurassic should probably ring a bell. Golden Age of the dinosaurs. And in Dinosaur National Monument, in the early 20th century, huge bone quarries were found. The main quarry that you can see at the visitor center at Dinosaur National Monument contains, I think, somewhere over 2,000 exposed dinosaur bones. And you see these things exposed like skulls and major pieces of backbones and huge dinosaur legs all together. This is probably somewhere, this was formed by some river washing lots of bones down and all getting covered up in river sediment. And so you have just sort of this hodgepodge of um, dinosaur pieces. But many full intact skeletons came out of this quarry, and they have been assembled and, and exhibited in all sorts of natural history museums uh, all over the world. Fossil Butte. This is a national monument. This is a, a, a administered by the National Park Service. Fossil Butte is in southwestern Wyoming. Now, what you can see at Fossil Butte are these rock formations. Um, this is a very arid area. Um, and in these layers that you can see here is sort of the horizontal layers or what they refer to as horizons, some of these horizons are extremely rich in fossil deposits, amazingly rich. And when uh, the Transcontinental Railroad was going through this region and they were dynamiting their way through the rock, the workers were just stunned to find rocks everywhere full of fossil fish. And the reason why they were full of fossil fish is that Fossil Butte is part of an ancient lake bed about 50 million years old, an enormous lake that covered that region of the, of the United States. And um, in these lakes, there would be some annual die-offs. Maybe as, as water levels became low or oxygen levels became low, there'd be massive die-offs. And as those fish became covered in silt and then uh, protected from further erosion, uh, for, from further decay, they became fossilized. And what you can find in layers of this rock, almost like the pages in a book, as you crack them open and open them up, you find these mass fish kills. In this slab alone, somewhere perhaps 80 fish in a piece of rock that's maybe, oh, maybe six feet long. There are other fantastic fossils at Fossil Butte that tell us something about what the area was like. This is not the sort of fossil, if you look at the current landscape of Wyoming, this is not the sort of thing you'd expect to see, perhaps. But yes, 50 million year old palm trees. Beautiful fossils, this one's probably about eight feet tall, of palm trees. Palm trees are telling us this was a tropical area, a semi-tropical area, probably had a climate a lot like South Florida 50 million years ago. Very different, of course, today. So, again, the environments have changed. The animal forms have changed. The plant forms have changed. Now, moving to even very recent deposits, here's a picture from about 1910 of an area known as the La Brea Tar Pits. And you may see in the back those oil derricks. And what those oil derricks are doing is they're extracting the petroleum products out of this bed. This bed is full of this thick, gooey, stinky um, uh, petroleum mess, very tarry sort of substance, but it had use as a um, petroleum derivative. And these tar pits are now in the dead center of Los Angeles. So there you are, surrounded by Los Angeles skyscrapers, but these tar pits have been set aside and preserved as a park and as a museum because they contain the most spectacular deposits of Ice Age mammals. So in these bone beds, which as you look down at them, and there's lots of open bone beds that you can view as you walk through the park, as you look in there, you see just piles of bones. And what happened was, as animals became trapped in this tarry goo, let's say something like a mammoth, scavengers would come along to feed on it and become trapped in the tarry goo. And scavengers would come by to feed on them and become trapped in the tarry goo. So you just have this, you know, so the equivalent of an early LA traffic jam, just a pile up <laughs> of dead animals forming in these tar pits. Well, the other great benefit is this tar is an incredible preservative. So while it takes a lot of work to clean it off, the bones underneath are exquisitely preserved. So there's hundreds of beautiful skulls of saber-toothed cats and of dire wolves and full skeletons.